Saturday, July 31st, 1971, a person or persons unknown travelled to southwest London carrying a bomb. The target was the home of Mr John Davis, then the Minister for Trade and Industry. The bomb was wrapped like a present in gold and blue paper and done up with a rosette and ribbon. It was to be the second to last in a series of 25 political bombings by the revolutionary group which called itself the Angry Brigade. An old lady in the flat opposite was injured. Afterwards, she described what happened. In view of the fact that Mr Davis is a government minister, I was uneasy on seeing this parcel. I telephoned the hall porter and asked him to come up and get it. I said I would wait for him. A few moments later, as I was standing on the landing... Tonight, a special World in Action report on the two girls sentenced to ten years each in jail for a bombing conspiracy. Hilary Creek, daughter of a wealthy stockbroker from Watford and former student at Essex University. After university, she did a brief spell as a teacher. Anna Mendelssohn, another former student at Essex, whose father works in Stockport Market. I never belonged to the Angry Brigade, no. I, d I, d I don't think the Angry Brigade was anything that you could belong to. I'd certainly never found you know, an Angry Brigade office or an Angry Brigade membership form to fill in. What was the Angry Brigade achieving by taking on ac undertaking actions of which the majority of the people in the country disapproved? That's your baby. Did they disapprove? <laughs> Did they disapprove? I've no idea. I mean, Did you like, disapprove? I just, I'm not, I'm not Did prepared to answer that sort of question. In fact, Hilary Creek didn't answer many questions, but Anna Mendelssohn was prepared to talk. We interviewed them three months ago when they were out on bail for a brief interval. Because it was the middle of their trial, certain questions could not be asked. However, although both girls pleaded not guilty to being members of the Angry Brigade, both sympathised with its revolutionary aims. Through them, we look tonight at the attitudes behind England's first homegrown guerrilla movement. Yesterday, after the longest criminal trial of the century, members of that movement were sentenced to a total of 40 years. Four of the eight defendants were found guilty of bomb attacks on cabinet ministers and others. John Barker, 24. 10 years. Christopher Bott, 25. Not guilty. Angela Weir, 28. Not guilty. Stuart Christie, 26. Not guilty. Catherine McLean, 22. Not guilty. James Greenfield, 23. 10 years. Hilary Creek, 23. 10 years. Anna Mendelssohn, 24. 10 years. She's already been a year in a woman's prison, awaiting trial and sentence. We had, well, how long was it for? for? For for five months, was it? This this guy um, came in and showed slides of his family on holiday in Scotland, in Wales, in Austria, in uh, France, and that was that went round again and again on a rotor. And just because we were in for a long time, we saw the same films. You know, the same slides of them all eating ham rolls when you, when you really fancy something to eat. And they're all sitting there eating their ham rolls and, and, um. and drinking sort of big mugs of coffee in, in a beautiful place. And, and you say something like, oh, bring us in a ham roll next time. <laughs> and he goes, well, you're in prison, aren't you? Right? And, and those are the sort of things that I don't know whether the blokes take that. I don't know what kind of, of classes, what, what you can do in prison if you're, if you're a bloke. But if you're, if you're a woman, you can do virtually nothing. You can pack plastic knickers. And if no. you're good, then they'll take you on for scrubbing. And this is what you'll do if you get a long sentence? It's, yeah. yeah it's not so. what we want to do. And if we do get a sentence, then, then, then 
then we've got to use that time because otherwise you just go like a vegetable if you're not like one already. <laughs> Anna Mendelssohn was born in Stockport in Cheshire 24 years ago. She got on well with her parents who are both active in local politics. Her father is a Labour councillor. My parents are very human people and my dad worked, my, both of them now work on, work on the markets um, and, and I, used to help, I used to help when I was, when I was little until I was about 14, 15 at the weekends and in holidays and sort of talking to people, uh, being, just being able to not just, oh God, oh, it's so difficult. I mean, I've, I've given up because it, it's, it, you know, you can just go on and on. She went to the local girls' grammar school where she was one of the brightest pupils and eventually became head girl. She worked hard to get to university and passed all her O and A level exams. My parents wanted me to have an education, education that they, that they never had, that they couldn't have. In 1967, Anna Mendelssohn was accepted by Essex University to study literature and sociology. By 1968, she'd become a militant socialist and was prominent during the weeks of student unrest at Essex that year. Our minimum demands have not been fulfilled. At this time, she met Hilary Creek. She became increasingly disillusioned with conventional university life and soon substituted political activism for academic study. The point in taking examinations and the point in getting a university degree and the point in looking forward to that kind of life dr drifted away from me. There was no point in it anymore. At some stage we have got to cry halt to all this procedure. This stage has now been reached. How would you describe your politics? Revolutionary. Paris, 1968, the year of student revolt. When the street fighting started in Paris, Anna Mendelssohn and other socialist students went to join the battle of left-wing students and workers against de Gaulle. 1968 was the revolutionary year which forged the politics of the angry brigade. From Chicago to Berlin, and even in communist Europe, young radicals fought their governments. In America, President Johnson was forced to stand down. De Gaulle never recovered from the French general strike. And even in the comparative calm of Britain, somebody had decided on a policy of revolutionary violence. In March 1968, an unknown revolutionary left a bomb by the side door of the Spanish embassy in London. The police believed that this was the first attack of those in the political conspiracy which came to be known as the Angry Brigade. All these early targets were foreign. There were 12 bomb attacks in all on foreign government buildings. After the Spanish embassy, bombs were left at a US officers club in London. Three Italian government offices in London, Birmingham and Manchester were bombed in a protest at the death of an anarchist allegedly murdered by the Italian police. Spanish banks in London and Liverpool were attacked four times. The offices of the Spanish state airline Iberia were bombed three times. The political motive behind the attacks was spelt out by a technique which was to become part of the bomber's style. A communique arrived signed by an anti-Franco organisation. Communique, 1st of May Group. It carried this warning. Kindly notify all persons flying or intending to fly by Iberia to tyrannical Spain that they are in danger. An immediate suspect for the anti-Franco bombings was Stuart Christie, who was acquitted yesterday on all charges. Christie spent three years in a Spanish jail for carrying bombs to Spanish anarchists and returned to Britain in 1967. The police had alleged that he was the link between the 1st of May group and the later Angry Brigade explosions. Christie, as a well-known anarchist, was a natural suspect, but the new politics of the Angry Brigade couldn't be given any of the usual left-wing labels, as the police soon discovered. They latched on to a group of people, not one particular group, a lot of people who knew each other, not everybody knowing each other, but by what we were doing, 
um, by being political, by wanting to change, I mean, this, this shitty world, if you like, and what's around us, who weren't in an organisation like IS, International Socialists, or International Marxist Group, or the Communist Party, you know, all, all the known sort of lefty focal points. Um, this is supposed to be uh, a piece here which is showing my lifestyle. Showing... The group philosophy was captured in a Thames television programme on student dropouts made in February 1970. Two of these men later appeared in the dock. John Barker, a Cambridge student who lived with Hilary Creek, got ten years. Christopher Bott was acquitted. That, you know, look at the squalid plate, look at the wall, look, so. look at the four of us. And here, here untrue. it is, is the way we're living. That's right. absolutely untrue. I mean, okay. That's That's the the one is world. reduced like in any other living situation outside. Here, I am reduced. Either I speak to a camera and I get a little bit of money, or I sit in a factory and I go boom, 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 yeah. boom for eight hours a day, yeah. and I get a little bit of money. Okay, you know, I, I mean, okay, in a way I destroy myself. But the very act of selling ourselves, okay, whether it be in a factory, whether it be in some sort of bureaucracy, whether even indeed I'm an industrial relations officer, or if I'm staring at a camera, I am destroying some part of myself just by, just by playing that little game. For the underground left, the new style politics meant battles with authority on community issues. They squatted in empty houses, tried to turn private squares into playgrounds, and as part of the underground left with its drug subculture, they were in frequent confrontation with authority. These social conflicts were seen as the first skirmishes in a revolutionary situation they hoped was developing in Britain. They saw the police as their class enemy. You know, I came out of, I came out of Nick. I'd not seen the television news for a year. I, I was watching it quite accidentally. I thought, it, I thought it was a film because there were these scenes of construction workers and, and police fighting, actually fighting on a picket line, you know, and the construction work workers were getting punched and kicked around and the police were coming in heavy and, and they were fighting, and they were fighting back because it's always the police that come in first. You don't want violence. You don't want them to send in the army. You don't want them to send in the police. You don't want to be busted, but it always, always happens. Five of the bomb attacks were against law and order targets. In the autumn of 1970, a small bomb was placed outside the Chelsea home of the Attorney General, Sir Peter Rawlinson. This time, the group claiming responsibility took their title from a popular western. Communique, the wild bunch. The message was equally melodramatic. He who liveth off the people, by the people shall he die. At the same time, the Putney home of the Commissioner of Metropolitan Police was also attacked. Another bomb was left at the site of the new Paddington Green police station. A building worker picked it up, thinking it was someone's sandwiches. Fortunately, it failed to explode. But the most direct attack in this period was on New Scotland Yard itself. While the police searched London for them, the bombers attacked the yard's computer room in Tintagel House. The political nature of the bombing was spelt out in a message which carried the signature by which the bombers came to be known. Communique, the Angry Brigade. It claimed, Police computers cannot tell the truth, they just record our crime. The pig murders go unrecorded. And in August 1971, it was the turn of the army to be attacked. A recruiting office in Holloway was bombed in protest against internment in Ulster. The Angry Brigade always claimed to attack property, not people. But on several occasions, their bombs came close to maiming or killing. If you're talking about the ethics, the ethics of bombs. You're saying that bombs are very dangerous things, and bombs can kill people, and killing people is not what we want, right? Putting a bomb in a cafe um, and not being in the position of making sure that there's no one there who's going to be killed, then, then then that's mindless. I mean, that's nothing to do with... with making a point about um, property or... 
or trying to make a hit at, at property which the ruling class own and which actually keeps them in power. The Miss World contest of 1970 was another target for the bombers. Like women's liberation, they saw the contest as a spectacle created by capitalism to exploit and degrade women. Inside the hall, it was a rowdy evening and smoke bombs were thrown by militant women. And outside the hall, a BBC broadcasting van, which was there to cover the event, was bombed on the previous evening by the angry brigade in an unsuccessful attempt to stop the program going out. Two of the 25 bombings were in support of women's lib. The second was particularly dangerous. The basement of Bieber's boutique was badly damaged by a bomb. The girl shoppers were evacuated after a warning, but a premature explosion might have caused many deaths. Again, a communique explained why. Communique, the angry brigade. The only thing you can do with modern slave houses called boutiques is wreck them. Six of the most significant bombings were linked to industrial disputes. The Ford offices, Ilford, Fords were bombed three times in a month, just as the company was emerging from the longest strike in its history. In a period of increasingly tense and sometimes violent industrial disputes, the job of catching the bombers had become a police priority. The Angry Brigade hoped that their bombings would influence the Ford strikers and other workers towards revolutionary action. Other Ford targets were an electrical transformer at Dagenham and the private residence of Ford's managing director in Britain, William Batty. The identity of the bombers was as much a mystery to him as it was to the police. There are theories who did it, uh, what group did it, but I am not really quite clear who the group are, uh, what they stand for or what they are against. Communique the angry brigade. The tone was confident. It's Ford tonight. We are celebrating our revolution which won't be controlled. The optimism of the revolutionaries at this time was heightened by the bitterness of the fight between the Conservative government and the unions. They saw this as the economic crisis of British capitalism which would bring about its ultimate collapse. When, those people, when, those, when the majority of people are asking for an extra five quid a week or whatever it is, and, and that whole scene provokes the government into declaring states of emergency and putting dockers in nick, then I mean, we're living in a pre-fascist era. But is that, in your, do you feel that that justifies the kind of bombing of ministers that went on in 1971? That's well, who's to justify it? Who's to justify it? It happened. In the last stage of their campaign, the bombers began to attack the homes of cabinet ministers. The Fulham home of John Davis was attacked, causing substantial damage when he announced the closure of the shipyards on Clydeside. Eight months earlier, it had been the turn of the Department of Employment and Productivity. The basement of their main offices in London was bombed in protest at the Industrial Relations Bill, which the government was then introducing in Parliament. Then, in the most dangerous attack of all, there were two big explosions at the Barnet home of Robert Carr in January last year. That same day, trade unionists had organised massive demonstrations all over Britain in protest against the Industrial Relations Bill. The bombers were confident and threatening. Communique, the angry brigade. Robert Carr got it tonight. We're getting closer. But this communique provided a vital handwriting clue that led to arrests. Barnet Police Station was now the centre for a major political manhunt. There had now been 18 bombings and there were seven more to come. But after the attack on a cabinet minister, the police put the pressure on. Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Habersham was put in charge of a hand-picked squad of 20 men, half of them drafted from the special branch. Within two months of the car bombing, two arrests. Ian Purdy had been a suspect because he had already been in jail for a firebomb attack on the Ulster office in London two years before. The other man arrested was Jack Prescott, who had met Purdy in prison. At their trial last December, Purdy was acquitted, but Prescott got 15 years for conspiring with the Angry Brigade. He addressed envelopes for the car communique. As the police closed in, Anna Mendelssohn was living at Wivenhoe near Essex University. As a friend of both Prescott and Purdy, she soon became a major suspect. She left just before the police came looking for her and her companion James Greenfield. 
They went underground with their friends John Barker and Hilary Creek. Using false names, they rented a flat at Amherst Road in Stoke Newington, London. According to police, this flat became the arsenal of the Angry Brigade, but time was running out. At Victoria Station on August the 19th, 1971, two of the group bought tickets for a day trip to France. It was to be their last day of freedom, and it was to supply the police with some vital evidence. The two travellers to France were John Barker, using the false name of Terry Lennox, and an unknown girl calling herself Rosemary Pink. The purpose of their visit, according to police, to bring back French gelignite. Hilary Creek was already in France. Both she and Barker denied going to collect explosives. Barker admitted to having notes of a plan to spring Prescott and Purdy from jail if they were found guilty. These notes read, There is a trial. Do what you want to do in France. These are our tactics for the trial. If he gets sent down, we'd want to get him out, so we'd like them to start thinking of finding places in France, etc., where they could disappear for some time, maybe on way to Algeria. On the following day, August the 20th, 1971, the police raided the Amherst Road flat. They found three firearms, a Sten gun, a Beretta submachine gun and a pistol, and 81 rounds of ammunition for these guns. They also found 33 sticks of French gelignite. In all the Angry Brigade explosions where gelignite had been identified, it had turned out to be French. And a conclusive piece of evidence, the printing set used to stamp all the Angry Brigade communiques and also a collection of documents. The police have named two other people they say are in the Angry Brigade. These have fled the country. Yesterday, the four revolutionaries were jailed. The jury recommended leniency and Judge James reduced their sentences by five years. Hilary Creek and Anna Mendelssohn are now beginning their sentences in Holloway Prison. While they were out on bail, we asked them to assess how much the Angry Brigade strategy had won the approval of the working class it had so desperately tried to influence. I have no idea. I should think a large. No, I have well, no who idea. knew what the Angry Brigade was doing? The, the only way in which we heard what so the Angry Brigade were doing what, was through, was through the press. Whatever do they do? Whatever do they tell you? I mean, mm. That's what I was meaning when I said... And you can never get anything through the mass media, particularly not anything of this nature. You can't believe that the most of the trade unionists in the country supported the bombing of, of the government ministers, even though they were involved in struggles with those government ministers. Well, I don't think that we could really expect that, because a lot of trade unionists, and, and when you talk about trade unionists, are you talking about people who, who have got positions of, of power in the hierarchy of the trades union, or are you talking about people on the shop floor? Both. I don't think you can talk about both because I think that the leadership in the trade unions are are a very are about very, are in very different positions and and have very different interests from people on the shop floor. As witness, Jack Jones and the Dockers and the and the kind of treatment he had. All right. Well, do you believe then that the rank and file supported what the anger began doing? Well, we don't know, do we? All we know is that now. Um, People in the working class, people on the shop floor, feel the need to get together and fight for what is being taken away from them. What is illegal and what is legal? It is the state's definition of what's legal and what's not legal. It's but not our occupying definition. A factory is not the same as, as placing bombs. Nobody's saying that it is the same. But therefore, what connection is there between the kind of action that the trade unions are take, undertaking or the trade unionists are undertaking now and what the Angry Brigade were trying to do? You think that the two that you can't you can't put them poles apart because it's all on the same side, you know it's all fighting against the state. And I don't think and I don't think that that in that in UCS or in um, a lot of the localized struggles that are going on both in industry and in community at the moment um, have have got in their totality a sense of uh, a, of revolutionary organization i mean i don't think that i don't think i think the sense exists but 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 the organi the revolutionary organization certainly doesn't exist we put one final question to anna mendelson 
the implication of what you're saying is that this would justify the kind of things the Anger Brigade did. When you're... when... It's the whole problem of justification. Um, I, th I think that I think that to justify to justify one's actions is 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 quite is a liberal is a liberal notion. It's to say that that one has to. I mean, you you learn, you know, you you learn you learn from from your experiences. You learn from your mistakes. Um, you learn from other people. Well, what have you learned from the Anger Brigade? What has that, that, that campaign, that series of bombs, what has that proved about Britain? What has that series of bombs proved to Britain? Yes. What is, it, what, what is the achievement of the Anger Brigade, in your opinion? Achievement in terms of change, in terms of what it's changed, hasn't changed anything. Hasn't changed anything at all.